All right, welcome back to the multi-factor ANOVA explainer for part three. If you missed what we did before, here you're going to get like the 30-second overview. We had Arnold. He got really confused because we ran a multi-factor ANOVA after running a single-factor ANOVA. The single-factor ANOVA showed traffic wasn't a significant predictor of how many newspapers were taken. When we ran the multi-factor ANOVA, all of a sudden traffic is a significant factor. What's going on? Arnold's confused. We don't know what's going on. Let's dig into next week. Then we went and we said, well, let's plot the data. It's all about the spread of the data. And there it is. The data is all spread out and how much of the spread you can attribute to the factors in your model. We broke it down all the way to the F value and saw that when you add factors to your model, well, it's gonna change the P values and the F values of models of factors that are already in that model. And actually it can change them to go up or down. Watch last week to figure out more. And then ultimately it all came down to this. Your judgment as an analyst is critical when you're doing statistics. This is not a hard science where the truth comes out when you run one statistical test. You gotta treat stats tests like you're looking at different perspectives on the same set of data and your decisions ultimately are going to benefit from having those multiple perspectives. All right, that was the first two sessions all together. What's going on this week? So when you're doing multi-factor ANOVA, what's going on graphically? Secondly, and critically, what is this new interaction term? And thirdly, who is Arnold? And what is Willis really talking about? All right, this graph actually tells you a huge amount. It tells you essentially all the conclusions we're gonna draw from multi-factor ANOVA. Multi-factor ANOVA is just gonna tell you, are these things we're finding in this graph statistically significant or not? You may recall we have newspaper distribution points. Some are inside and some are outside locations. And these dis distribution boxes are either in low, medium, or high traffic areas as shown on the graph. Um, we collected data from 60 distribution boxes. That's why there are 59 degrees of freedom. And we actually had 10 at each of these different six possible settings. A setting being like an inside location that is low traffic right up here. One thing you can see is that whether you're inside or outside makes a big difference. These are all the inside locations. These are the outside locations. It looks like inside locations have a lot more papers taken from them. Something else you can see is that there's not a lot of difference inside depending on the traffic of that inside area. Whereas outside, it looks like there might be a difference based on traffic uh, level and how many papers are taken. Now, are these differences statistically significant or not? That's what we need multi-factor ANOVA to help us figure out. Looking at this way of viewing our factors is really helpful in understanding multi-factor ANOVA results and really sets us up to think about design of experiments also. First of all, I wanna point out that this is a balanced design. And what that means is that we have the same number of distribution boxes at each of our six possible types of distribution boxes. And when I say a type of distribution box, like A up here, this is boxes that are outside and low traffic flow areas. And so with, a, with only two factors, we can visualize this here on a flat two-dimensional um, uh, representation of our six total possible combinations or types of distribution boxes. We're going to use um, this uh, representation of our uh, factors to look at our main effects plots. Main effects is a very important term in multi-factor ANOVA in design of experiments. It's just the effect of each factor by itself. And, and by looking at these plots, what we can see is that location makes a big impact on how many papers are taken. That's because... We can see that because of this steep slope, this big difference between inside and outside. It looks like traffic on the other hand 
has maybe a little impact, maybe maybe higher traffic areas um, have more papers taken than lower traffic, but it's not as big of an impact as um, location. But where are these data points coming from? Let's look right up here. It's important to understand where this average comes from. And in this case, what we're doing is we're taking all the data from points that are inside and averaging those points to get the main effect plot. And so data from D, E, and F, 30 data points are used to form in that, that, um, that mean value. Down here, it's all the points that are outside. So A, B, and C. And so important also to note is that there are 30 data points at each of the inside and the outside to inform, you know, what, what, uh, what's the mean value to plot on the plot. Similarly, over here on the traffic, our low traffic area is from data in points A and D. Medium traffic from points B in E and high traffic from points C and F. Each of these points on the main effect plot for traffic um, is, is based on data from um, 20 distribution boxes. And so uh, the total 60 divided by three. This is a real powerful element uh, of multi-factor ANOVA when you have uh, points at every combination uh, for the combination of your different factors. Um, and it's referred to as a full factorial design, more on that later. And a power of that is it's very efficient in its use of data. All the evaluations are using all of the data points to make the evaluations. Hey, slight note is that the way uh, Minitab, which I used to make this graph, computes these graphs, actually uses the quote unquote fitted means when it plots it on this graph. And so the fitted means are slightly different but everything, the concept that I just said um, is totally valid. Just know that the fitted means are a little different than if you were to take the actual data points and just average them to try to form some of these points on this graph. Ah, interaction plots. These are a really cool part of multi-factor ANOVA. And an interaction is just looking at the impact of more than one variable at a time. In this case, two variables at a time or two factors at a time. Let's look at the top right plot uh, first. This plot is splitting up our data a little differently than the main effects plots. And you can see this blue line, uh, the, the higher line is for distribution boxes that are inside. And the red dotted line, dashed line, is for distribution boxes that are outside. And from left to right, the three points are for low, medium, and high traffic areas. So what this is saying is that, you know, for distribution boxes inside, it looks like traffic doesn't change things very much. And then for distribution boxes outside this red dashed line, it looks like actually, the more traffic there is, you're seeing uh, more papers being taken. Uh, this plot in the bottom left actually is the exact same six data points from above, just grouped differently. And so now we're grouping it by inside versus outside location. And just like before, we saw that traffic didn't matter very much when we were inside. That's represented here by all of these three lines for low, medium, and high traffic being very close to each other inside. Outside, however, we see that our blue line, which is low traffic, has the fewest papers taken. And our green dotted line which is high traffic areas, has the most papers taken. That's all an interaction is. It's saying that the impact of one factor depends on the setting of another. The impact, for instance, in the top right plot up here, the impact of, um, of traffic from left to right depends on whether you're inside or 
your outside. And you could flip that and think about it the other way in the bottom left graph, the impact of location inside versus outside isn't the same for low, medium, and high traffic areas. They all get more traffic inside than outside, but the change from, from outside to inside is the biggest for areas that have low traffic. And that's what an interaction is. Let's go and look at our model in the bottom right corner, our representation of our two factors, location and traffic flow, and how they map to an interaction plot. And because we actually know these two different interaction plots are just different ways of grouping the same data, I'm only gonna focus on the top right one. And now what we're gonna see is, let's start by looking at this point right here. Those are inside locations at low traffic inside locations, low traffic, those are going to be the 10 distribution boxes at point D is going to, is going to be what forms that data point. And then right here, this is inside locations that are medium traffic. And then finally, inside locations that are high traffic is point F. And if we were to do that for the outside uh, line here up on the interaction plot, we would start with outside and low traffic is A, and then B, and then C. We can flip over and look at this bottom left graph now just to kind of see it. All three of the inside locations are uh, on the left side, regardless of how much traffic they are. It's because that's because they're all getting the same amount of papers being taken. And so actually points, there are three different points up here on top of each other, D, E, and F. And then the outside locations, the high traffic area is point C, the 10 distribution boxes from point C, the 10 distribution boxes from point B are the medium traffic. And then the 10 distribution boxes from point A are represented by this blue dot at the bottom. Um, where um, we have outside and low traffic. So that's all it is. These graphs look a little confusing at first and it's super easy to get turned around and kind of confused when you're looking at them. But A, know that the, the top right graph and the bottom left graph, it's the same information just presented differently. So sometimes one is easier to interpret than the other. Um, uh, and it's really just um, taking your data that you have from your different factor combinations and plotting them. You can map it right back to these, fact, these factor combinations, A, B, C, D, E, and F in this case. So I think it's pretty cool. We come back to this interval plot we saw earlier. It is so related, if you haven't already noticed, to this top right graph. I mean, you can see it, right? The blue the blue um, line on the interaction plot for inside locations, I mean, it's right here. I'm drawing it in red. And then the dashed line for outside locations is right down here. Um, I've always been kind of bummed out that they don't put uh, confidence intervals on interaction plots. But you know, if you want to get your confidence intervals, you can go and make the same kind of plot using an interval plot as an example. So interactions are just when the impact of one factor on the response depends on the level of another factor. Like here, traffic only impacts the number of papers taken at outside locations. In inside locations, the low, medium, or high traffic doesn't really seem to impact how many papers are taken. So this is a really powerful concept. It's way more powerful than studying newspaper distribution boxes. For instance, in K-12 education, um, there are studies all the time where people are looking at different educational innovations and in interventions to see how they impact the learning of kids in K-12 schools. And so you might find that, hey, this educational intervention had a big impact on, um, on the learning of a certain concept in school. Fantastic. But what if you entered in another factor, such as socioeconomic status of the school? And you found out that intervention really only worked in the wealthiest schools. All of a sudden, that's an interaction and your conclusion could change drastically. Or let's put it out for sports. 
uh, and you're looking at the number of points a certain like basketball players would score in the first half and the second half of a game. Well, that difference may not be the same for home and away games. All right, so if it wasn't, there'd be an interaction. Uh, or what about like the gender pay gap? You're looking at the difference between how much men and women are paid for the same job. If this gender gap was larger in one sector and smaller in another, then that would be an interaction. So maybe that pay gap only exists in certain industries or it exists in a lot of industries, and it, but it's worse in some than others. That would be an example of an interaction. All right, so I gotta make sure I highlight this. We don't want you to make the mistake I'm about to make on the next slide. So based on our analysis of variance results, we can see that location and traffic are both significant factors because their p-values are low. And then looking at the main effects plots, clearly inside locations and locations with high traffic have the greatest need for papers. So in conclusion, inside locations with high traffic need the most papers. Alerts should be going off right now because you've ignored the interaction term. If we were to come in and look at the interaction term, you already know because you've been watching this video that in fact, that isn't the right conclusion to make. A better conclusion would be that all inside locations need the most papers because traffic level, low, medium, or high doesn't have a big impact when you're inside. That's hidden by looking at the main effects without looking at the interactions when there's a significant interaction. So to sum up this, interactions are when the impact of one variable depends on the setting of another. They're really important in all sorts of industries and all sorts of analyses. And when interactions are present, you've got to make sure you don't make conclusions based only on the main effects. Hey, that wraps up our multi-factor ANOVA explainer three-part series. Thanks for hanging in there. It's been fun.